Hey guys, welcome back to the final recitation, <clears throat> excuse me, for ENGR 210, at least as far as the quiz recitations are concerned. I will take a look into doing a final exam recitation to help prepare you with some of the exam type problems that you can see. However, for, for now, this is going to be our last recitation, at least in this format. So today I want to address a few different things. Now, Professor Zorman actually pr pretty clearly outlined what you can expect to see on your quiz tomorrow. And so I'm going to focus on problems that are very much like what you're going to see. He, took, he talked about being able to derive a transfer function given a circuit. And given the fact that we've been working mostly with active filters for the last few homework assignments, we're going to focus on active filters for this recitation section. Tomorrow you could see a regular filter, but just a reminder, an active filter is a frequency dependent circuit that incorporates an op amp, while a passive filter is a frequency dependent circuit that just has components. So an RC filter is a, a passive filter, whereas a filter like the one that you see on the screen before you is an active filter. So we're going to focus on active filters. I have two active filter problems, but you could see a passive filter tomorrow. And in fact, the math is easier for a passive filter in some respects. So I'm going to go with the active filter so that, that you can see, rather for a passive filter, the math is easier than an active filter. So I'm going to go with an active filter so that you can be prepared for pretty much the most difficult problem that you could see on your exam tomorrow or on your quiz tomorrow. At the end of the video also, I'm going to show you how to derive the phase angle spectral plot or the phase plot for a standard form transfer function. And you can skip that part of the video if you wish, but I do think, especially for those of you who are going to go on in your electrical engineering careers, or for those of you who are systems engineers particularly, or even for those of you who are mechanical engineers, eventually you're going to have to take a class ECSE 304, which is a control engineering class. So you would benefit from having a little bit of an introduction to the strategy that I'm going to show about how to solve some of these spectral plots and how to how to make these plots in a very quick and easy manner. So I highly recommend that if you're one of those three majors, anything in the ECSE department or a mechanical engineer, that you take the time to, to watch that last part of the video because I, I think you'll find it useful, if not now, in the future. So before we get started, I do just want to tell you how much of a pleasure it has been to have you, all of you in class this semester. I am so sorry that the semester had to be the way that it is. Obviously, this was not what any of us wanted. The pandemic is, is what it is. But I, I have greatly enjoyed working with all of you. And I really do hope that in the future, if you ever need anything, you'll consider contacting me. I, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about any future circuit problems you're taking, especially those, those of you who are electrical engineers or, or any just problems that you have as, as a student in my role with USG or any problems that you have, period, uh, in, in your career. Sometimes older students can have some different experiences to help you kind of navigate some of those issues that whether they're endemic to case or endemic to your academic experience that, that we might be able to help you with. And I, I would be more than happy to have that discussion with you at a, at a later time. If ever you need anything, please know that you're always welcome to reach out. And, and like I said, it has been a pleasure having you in class. So let's go ahead and get started with this problem. I, I have three problems that I've selected here to show you. This first problem is asking us to determine the voltage transfer function and then make sure that we've written the function in standard form once we've derived it. So first off, let's understand what we're looking for in terms of a transfer function. So a transfer function is simply defined, and, and this is really an important definition, h of w is equal to the output voltage divided by 
the input voltage, which in this case is a source voltage Vs. So that's our ultimate goal. So we need to find ways that we can represent V out in terms of Vs and then solve. So we always want to start with our op amp assumptions. which we know in this particular case are that VP is equal to VS, which is equal to VN. VP, VN, and that has to be equal to this VS. And that IP is equal to IN, which is equal to zero. And these are all going to be in the frequency domain. So we can write our node voltage expression this is going to be zero over here. This is going to be our Vs. And here's going to be our V out. So we have Vn minus zero all over, in this particular case, Rs plus 1 over j omega c, or we can just rewrite that as Vn over Rs minus j divided by omega c. By the way, my omegas do kind of look like a w, but I trust me, it is it is an omega, uh, but, but it does kind of look like a w. And then we have plus our next term, which is going to be Vn minus V out all over Rf. And that's just going to be equal to zero. And we derive this via node voltage at our Vn node. Well, we know that Vn is equal to Vp and Vs. So that's going to give us the expression that we need. What we can do is, and I'm just going to kind of do a little bit of a little bit of algebra here so we have vs over rs minus j over omega c plus vs over rf by the way all of my voltages are in the frequency domain i'm just not going to <laughs> i'm just not going to write it in in that particular format just so we can just so we can continue in that particular way uh, equals V naught over RF. I'm just going to bring over, I'm going to split up that fraction and bring over V naught over RF. Now we can multiply through by RF and also factor out a VS. So we have VS, 1 over RS minus J over omega C. I'm going to turn this into an RF. Plus v plus one. I'm sorry. Is equal to v. There we go. So that's our expression as we have it written. In this case, what are we looking for? Well, our transfer function is just going to be v out over v s, which is simply equal to R f over R s minus j over omega c plus one. And so that's our transfer function. If we didn't really care about writing it in standard form, we would be done. And, and that would be the expression that we have. But we, we do want to write it in standard form. We all want to make sure that we get full credit on tomorrow's exam, tomorrow's quiz, I suppose. So we can rewrite our 1 in a fancy way. We can use the common denominator plus Rs minus J um, over omega C over Rs minus J over omega C. And I just turned this one into Rs minus J omega C, J over omega C over Rs minus J over omega C. And then I added those together. Remember, we're trying to get all of our, our terms into the format where we have omega C, or I'm sorry, omega, I, j omega isolated. So what we can do then is we can say, all right, we have a 
constant v out over vs is equal to what? Well, it's equal to rf plus rs minus j over omega c. And then we have a term in the bottom, which is just rs minus j over omega c. And here's where we can do our bit of factoring. What we can say is we can say, well, I have a, I have terms that I want to get. Basically, I want to turn this into a one. I want to turn this into a one. And so what I can do is I, I also want to get my j omega c in into a, a form where it looks like standard form, which is kind of in the one plus j omega divided by omega c format. I'm trying to get all my factors in this form. So I'm going to have to multiply by this omega c over j term so that I can turn everything into ones and 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 ones and and, zero, and constants basically. So what I can do is I can simply multiply through turn this into a plus make this into a 1 over j omega c, turn this into a plus, make that into 1 over j omega c, multiply through by j omega c. What I'm going to get is rf plus rs times j omega c plus 1 all over 1 plus omega c j R, S. Now, this is actually standard form. And, and to, in order to make this clear, let me rewrite this expression. But th this is standard form. What this expression really looks like is 1 plus j omega divided by 1 over c times r, f plus rs, and 1 plus j omega divided by 1 over c times rs, OK? So these are our omega c's, our cutoff frequencies. And this expression, this transfer function, is now in standard form. So now we've successfully solved. And we can use that trick for any transfer function, multiply, basically make, making our one into a fancy one by, by matching the denominator, pulling out common factors out of our terms. Those are the strategies that we want to use in order to make sure that we get our equation into standard form. Now, I do want to caution you. There's more than one. <laughs> this this is something that you'll find, especially if you're electrical engineers that take upper level classes, you'll find that there is more than one standard form, quote unquote. Different textbooks have different standard forms. This particular standard form is very common for this type of transfer function. But what you're going to learn in the future is that there there is more than one form in which you can analyze circuits. There is the Fourier domain, which is the frequency domain here. There's also the Laplace domain. There's the Z transform domain. So, so we have a few different options for how we can analyze circuits. And each one kind of has its own slightly different uh, convention for how it's written. But for our purposes, this is the standard form that we're going to be using. And so those are the strategies that you can use in order to get your expression into that standard form. And I, I think that you are all very good at math. So I, I entrust you to do that. For our next problem, we're going to do something very similar, but maybe a little bit more complicated. And what we're going to do here is we're going to do the same thing in terms of finding a, a, an output voltage here. So again, writing our op-amp assumptions just as we usually do. 
In this particular case, we know that Vn is equal to Vp, which is equal to zero, given the fact that we have our ground. And we also know that In is equal to Ip is equal to zero. So there's another thing here that I, I, I just want to talk about very quickly because it is it is convention. Typically speaking, lowercase and uppercase values of uh, I and V are used for, for different applications. So, so typically speaking, not always, but, but typically speaking, you would use uh, uppercase denotation or, or, or uppercase um, lettering to take a look at and, and to denote when you are using the AC domain, and you would use lowercase i's and v's when you're denoting the DC domain, but that that's just that's just a, a matter of convention also. Anyway, so now we've written our assumptions. We can go through and do our analysis. And we want to do our analysis at Vn, which we know is equal to 0. So we have our, here we have our um, value for Vn. So we're going to have 0 minus Vs over rs minus j over omega c. I'm just going to uh, skip the through step there. Now, for this next particular part, what, what we're going to see here is that we have to find an equivalent impedance. And I'm just going to write this equivalent impedance up here as ZEQ for now to make our lives and our analysis a bit easier. So plus zero minus V out divided by ZEQ is equal to zero. Because we know that's just going to be a fancy constant. OK, so now we have negative VS, we have negative V out negative Vs over Rs minus J omega C is equal to V out over ZEQ. V out divided by Vs is equal to negative ZEQ, excuse me, divided by Rs minus J over omega C. So that is our transfer function in non-standard form. Now we can go ahead and write our, and this is equal to h omega. Now we can go ahead and we can find our zeq. So here we have a capacitor that we can write negative j over omega cf. And we have our impedance of our resistor, which is just RF. We know that we can multiply together in the denominator RF times negative J over omega CF all over RF minus J over omega CF. We're just adding the two values together. And this is our ZEQ which we can plug back into our expression, and we can then go ahead and simplify down to standard form, if we so chose. So we're going to do V out over Vs is equal to negative, in this particular case, the negative sign is going to go away because we have a negative sign from our ZEQ as well as from our expression. 
So we're going to just take that away. Z, this becomes J R F divided by omega C F divided by R F minus J over omega C F times R S minus J over omega C. S. That's the CS. The input capacitor. It was right here. Okay. And so that is our transfer function. And if we wanted to leave it like that, that would be perfectly fine. Um, we could go through and we could do the simplification to standard form, but we're actually going to do the uh, simplification to standard form is going to be part of the next problem. So we can we can leave that one be. We don't we don't need to really do it on this particular problem because we're going to do it heavily on the next. So for this problem, we just have a few basic uh, calculations that we're asked to perform, and this is kind of the not the upper extent, but th but this is going to be one of the main operations that or some of the this should summarize some of the main operations that you should be able to perform on transfer functions as you are going through and preparing for tomorrow's quiz. So if if any of this is difficult for you or if any of this is kind of quote unquote news to you when I go through and talk about it, I, I would look at this material because I, I do think that this is going to be some of what Professor Zorman's talking about when he's talking about working with and manipulating transfer functions that have already been written. So I, I, I do want to emphasize that to you, and I and I leave that to you to go ahead and review if any of this sounds unfamiliar to you. So we're going to go through and perform each of these calculations. The first two are actually just pretty much math. So we were trying to find the magnitude in terms of omega. Well, remember that we're given negative 12 dBs. We know that to convert into the dB scale, we multiply, we rather perform the operation of 20 log on our m of omega, on our on the the magnitude of the transfer function. So m of omega denotes the magnitude of the transfer function, which is h of omega. And, and we can find that just finding the magnitude of complex numbers like you would learn in a calculus class. Now, the inverse operation of a logarithm is an exponentiation. So we can divide by 20. This is equal to log m of omega. We can exponentiate both sides. So this is 10 to the minus 0.6 is equal to m of omega, which is equal to 0 0.25. It's equal to m of omega. Simple calculation, just asking you to, to convert between the two. So this next question is asking you just as much about uh, how well you know your definitions as it is about how you do the calculation. The magnitude of the transfer function is equal to m of omega. Okay, that, that is by definition the case. So we, when we're calculating mdb, the same definition from before applies. MdB is equal to 20 log of m of omega, which we have given in our problem. So this is ends up being 20 log 6 divided by 5 times 10 to the fourth, which when you go ahead and solve for that, and I, and I, I just put this in my calculator, is negative 78.42 decibels. Okay, so that provides us a pretty easy way to go ahead through and solve. The last problem requires us to simplify this transfer function and to write it in standard form. So what we can do 
is we can go through and factor each one of these terms. So we have j 10 to the eighth. What are we going to factor out of the first term? Well, we're going to factor out a 10, which is going to leave us 1 plus j omega over 10 divided by. So what are we going to factor out of the bottom term? This is a squared term, so we have to factor 20 squared out of that term. And then we can write our term just as we would before. Again, we're going to pull out a 500. And then we're going to pull out a, a 1,000. Whoops. Sorry, that writing that you saw uncovered there was my initial solving of the problem. Okay. Now we can simplify all of this down. Negative J5, 1 plus J omega over 10, over... 1 plus j omega over 20 squared, 1 plus j omega over 500, 1 plus j omega over 1,000. Okay? And if we wanted to find our poles and our zeros, well, our zeros are going to be, why'd I do that? Zeros are going to be uh, just a 10, and our poles are going to be 20, 500, and 1,000. Note we have a double pole at 20, since this is a squared term. So that is uh, something to take note of. And, and that is how we write our function in standard form. OK. So one thing that I did promise is I told you that I would show you the very basics of how to plot a spectral or, or, or the phase of a very basic transfer function. And so I, I am going to do that right now. So I'm going to simplify down this particular transfer function so that we can use it. So I'm going to I'm going to give you the transfer function h of omega is equal to let's just do 1 plus j omega over 10 divided by 1 plus j omega over 500 and 1 plus j omega over 1000. So that's going to be our transfer function. And you know how to, roughly speaking, plot the, the phase of, of this. The, the, I'm sorry, not the phase. You know how to plot the magnitude of this, roughly speaking. You go through, you take the magnitude of, of each particular term, you take a look at how that is plotted over the course of a uh, over the course of whatever kind of idea you're taking a look at, and usually you would do that in the 20 log domain so that you can have something that's that's nice to look at. So we're just going to take a look at the phase in this particular problem. Phase plot. How do we do this? Well, as we've talked about already in the past. The way to find the phase of an imaginary number is to take the arc tangent of we we represent each of the 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 parts using real and imaginary is to take the arc tangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part right and we we've talked about that before We've talked about that before in the context of going into the phasor domain. We've talked about this before, just generally speaking. We can apply that same thing here to our analysis of transfer functions. And especially when we're doing the application for a transfer function that has a few poles and a few zeros, we can really apply that to each individual term 
and then sum together the effects of each one of those terms to take a look at what our overall result is going to be. Now, I, I do want to do a little bit of a disclaimer. What I'm about to show you is a shortcut. It's not necessarily the most mathematically accurate way to think about this problem, but it's a shortcut that it would allow you to draw a very basic, quote unquote, quick and dirty plot that would give you an idea as to how your filter is going to respond in terms of the phase diagram. Now, what does this phase diagram mean? So what this phase diagram is going to tell you is at a certain frequency, what is going to be the phase of my output with respect to my input? In the frequency domain, not only are we going to have an attenuation, or which is, which is basically just an, uh, a, 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 us filtering out a signal. So an attenuation is when you take a signal and you make it smaller. It's basically the kind, you can think of it as like the opposite of a gain, a gain of less than one. Not only is our filter going to, at least in the vast majority of cases, not only is our filter going to make the input signal smaller in the stop band and take a signal and make the magnitude very, very small, in the area outside of the region of interest, but across the entire spectrum of frequencies, our filter is also going to shift the phase of our input signal. Why is that? Well, you've seen how capacitors and inductors, which we have in pretty much present in, in every filter that we take a look at in some combination or another, You've seen how capacitors and inductors are able to change the phase of a signal. We saw this when we analyzed kind of basic RC filters in the lab, basic RL filters in the lab. And, and that's true of pretty much any filter. So when we write the transfer function, what we're taking a look at is we're taking a look at the effect of those inductors and capacitors on the input signal. And of course, because of the fact that each of those components has an impact on the phase of the output signal, we're going to see those impacts on the phase of the output signal for an entire filter that incorporates those elements. So that's what we're taking a look at when we're plotting the phase of a filter, is we are taking a look at the mechanism by which the filter is going to shift the phase of the output with respect to the input. So how do we do it? Well, what we can do is we can take a look at each term and we can say the arctangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part. So this is kind of misleading a little bit. When we take the imaginary part of a complex number, we actually drop the imaginary number. So for example, we, we don't really care so much about the j. So the imaginary part of 1 plus j omega over 10 is actually omega over 10. <laughs> I know that that's counterintuitive. And because it's divided by 1, then, then we're in good shape. So, so I, I know that that's a little bit counterintuitive, but, but that is the common notation in mathematics is when you're talking about the imaginary part of a number, it's actually denoting the coefficient of the imaginary number in that complex number. So if you ever see that notation, don't be confused by it, but what they're asking you for is what is j multiplied by? Or if you're in a math class or a stats class, they're asking you what is i multiplied by? So ju just, just be aware of that. That's a co very common notation. Anyway, we can, take the, we can take the coefficient of each angle and we can subtract the ones that are in the denominator. I go divide by 500 minus arctangent omega by a thousand. So what you can see here is that I have these three different terms to this expression. Now it it's worth taking a look at what the graph of arctangent looks like. 
The graph of our arc tangent looks something like this, where we have 90 degrees at infinity. We have a negative infinity, negative 90 degrees, and then there's a very nice little slope that's up there that that that, that moves through, and that that's kind of and it, at at each of at all of these values, we we just have this nice smooth curve that kind of goes up through, and at zero or where wherever this this point may be, for in terms of that value, we have a, a value that's roughly speaking, you know, we have, we have zero. We have a transition between 45 and 90 in the positive infinity direction, and then between zero and negative 90 in the negative direction. So that's the terminal behavior of the arc tangent function. Now, if you take a look at this, for small values of arc tangent, so for arc tangent of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, very close to zero, we can, to a first approximation, say that the arc tangent is going to be roughly equal to zero. Um, where it gets to be interesting is is when we start to get into the bigger values. Now the arc tangent of one is 45. It's 45 degrees. So basically, when this term inside the argument of the arc tangent becomes one, then we kind of say, all right, well now that arc tangent is quote unquote active. And, and we can take a look at the effects of that. So I'm going to just draw a plot, a spectral plot for this particular, this particular um, filter. Okay. Now I'm, I'm actually going to extend this down a little. Well, no, we'll just do this. So this is going to be negative 90. This is going to be negative 180. This is going to be zero. This is going to be 90. Okay. So take a look at, and then for this, I'm going to do 10, 500, 1000. Okay. So this is just a very quick plot. So at, and we can do our half points at each. So at omega is equal to 10, Arc tangent of omega over 500 is going to be basically zero. It's going to be arc tangent of 1 over 50. And arc tangent of omega over 1,000 is going to be basically zero. It's going to be 10 over 1,000, which is going to be 1 one hundredth. But arc tangent of omega divided by 10 is going to be equal to 45 degrees. So at omega is equal to 10, we have that value. And then we have a, a smooth curve that goes up to that value. Then as omega becomes larger and larger and larger, we're going to have, we're going to approach 90. Now, as we get close to the value 500 in terms of our frequency, let's say at 500, now we're going to have our, I'm going to just erase this a little bit. We're going to have our, our second term kick in. Remember, though, now this term at 500, our arc tangent of omega over 10 term, is at arc tangent of 500 divided by 10, which is, which is just going to end up being arc tangent of 50, which is very, very far out. That's, that's basically still going to be 90 degrees. And at arc tangent, or, and at and at 500 degrees, we're going to have 90 degrees contributed from this first arc tangent, and we're going to have minus 45 degrees contributed from the second arc tangent. So we're going to have something that looks like that. So it's going to end up being at 45 at around 500, and then it's going to continue down. And and the the effects of of those two arc tangents are going to eventually cancel each other out to the point where we have a nice curve down to zero again. I did not draw this particularly well. I'm no Leonardo da Vinci, that's for sure. But you kind of get the idea. And we're going to continue on our merry way 
until we get to about 1,000. And now at 1,000, we have our positive 90 degrees and our negative 90 degrees. They're canceling each other out because those are basically both at very large numbers at this point. We're kind of out here on the arctangent graph. And now we have this arctangent that starts to figure its way in. At 1,000, it's going to be at negative 45. And then it's going to continue down. Oh, I way overshot that. It's going to continue down to negative 90. Oops, a daisy. So it's going to be about negative 45 at 1,000, and then it's going to flatten out as it goes to infinity. Okay. So that's how we can draw a very quick phase plot of our filter signal. Okay. So again, what does this what does this kind of say? Well, it says that at a frequency of 10, our output is going to be shifted for positive 45 degrees with respect to our input. At phase 500, the same is true. Between 500 and 1000, we're going to have not so much phase shift in terms of our filter. There's not going to be a whole lot of phase shift. But at 1,000, now we're going to have a negative 45 degree phase shift. And anything above 1,000, we're going to get closer and closer and closer to a negative 90 degree phase shift. Okay, So that's really what we're taking a look at when we do a phase plot, is we're just plotting the angle of those complex numbers over the course of the frequency response of the filter. Okay, so I hope that this was helpful, or at very least, if it wasn't helpful, and I, I don't think that it, I, like I said, you're outside of the scope of this class, but perhaps for all of your future classes, I hope that if you're still watching this and you did not need to, that at least you found it somewhat interesting. And if there's anything that I can do, like I said, please never hesitate to reach out. It has been a pleasure working with you this semester. And, and as I said, please never hesitate. I'm, I'm always here to help in any way that I possibly can. Thank you all.